Um, the topic of my uh, presentation today is the chemical resistance to the rower in New Zealand. Thank you. Um, I want to cover a number of issues. I want to talk about say, chemical resistance. I want to talk about the future of synthetic chemicals, the chemicals that most of you are using to draw for at the moment. And I want to talk about what life looks after synthetic chemicals. But before I start, I guess I want to set the scene. And I want to read you out an email that was posted on um, one of the distribution lists. And it was written by a beekeeper in the North Island about this time last year. And it goes, this year, once the honey was finished, I applied AP stain strips to my hives as usual for the statutory eight weeks. <coughs> nice to see. I took them out during late March, early April. Everything up to that point looked honky-dory. When I went back one month later to get the hives prepared for winter, I was shocked what I found. Wing damaged bees, nearly hatched bee cadaver strewn all over the floor and outside the hive. Adult mites on bees and hive parts, greatly reduced bee numbers and greater than normal hive losses. I have since acquired a resistance test kit, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, and found the Apistan kill efficiency ranges from zero to 50% on those hives tested. That's a far cry from the 95% that I had traditionally come to expect. I have since purchased and applied a different, in brackets, non frivalinate product to knock down the mites before winter starts in earnest. I always knew this day was coming, but it certainly sneaked up and caught me by surprise. Here in the Auckland area, we've had 10 good years out of Pakistan, but it seems to be mimicking the North American experience of finding significant resistance after a decade. Let this be a warning. I hope you don't get caught out like me. And I don't think I could have put it better um, than a beekeeper, a beekeeper who seems to be involved in the problem. So, so I'll take you back a little bit now and we'll talk about chemical resistance and what results we have to indicate how big the problem is. I'd like to be standing in front of you talking about our bioassay that is the kind of internationally recognised standard for measuring resistance. But unfortunately we've not done that in New Zealand um, since this, this resistance test um, issue developed, mainly because it's quite an expensive one and the money's really not been there to do it. So what's happened is a different approach has been taken to try and establish whether we have resistance. And the approach is to use the same kit that this beekeeper is talking about. And it's the USDA test, and basically all it is is a jar with a mesh lid, a piece of cardboard in it, and a little piece of AP stand or bear roll stapled onto that card. You fill it full of bee, bees, and then 24 hours, you tip it upside down and you shake all the dead varroa out, and then you wash the rest in alcohol and, and get the live varroa out. Um, if you want a description of it, um, by way of advert, um, if you haven't got a copy of the Vero manual, which will ha has got some of that and a lot of other useful information, make sure you buy one at some stage. Um, it's not an advert on my part, I don't get a royalty out of it, unfortunately. Um, but it's really well worth having. So at any rate, when Vero first came into New Zealand, Matt asked us to quickly check the population to make sure that the Varroa wasn't already resistant. And when we did this test, what we did, and what we typically find is if you put your bees in there for 24 hours, it kills between 95 and 100% of the varroa. And if it does that, we know that we don't have resistance. That was the conclusion from the varroa when they first came into New Zealand. And since that, about every year, we get a phone call from a beekeeper somewhere in New Zealand who says, oh, I think I've got resistance. And most of those we investigate in some shape or form, and when we do, we go and test the bees, we find that they actually don't have resistance. We've not been able to support that at all. But about a year or so ago, we got a, yet another phone call, this time from North Auckland, somebody who said that they had 
taking the acne stain strips out, and there were varroa running around inside their hive, and I think they've got resistance. Um, they sent us some, some bees and some varroa, unfortunately not a lot, um, but we tested them with the acne stain te test, sorry, with the res USDA resistance test. And what we found, instead of killing 95% of varroa, it only killed about 20% of varroa. Our first question was, something wrong with the test here? So we rushed out, grabbed some varroa and some bees out of one of our hives nearby. Um, this is a Ruakura in Hamilton. Tested those, and of course they tested exactly the way we expect them to as not being resistant. A year later now, we got a phone call from a hobbyist this time in um, Hamilton. He said, I'm taking my strips out, and I see varroa running around everywhere. We got a decent size sample this time and tested it, and Lo and behold, we got very small kill rate again. Again, very suggestive of resistance. But this time, we had enough bees to test Beverol as well, and same result for both of them. Uh, very low kill rates. So, as that's, I guess, part of the evidence we have for resistance. <coughs> we also have a lot of conversations now we've had with beekeepers, mainly um, the North, upper North Island, and um, cases like this one here. Um, I've sat with, on the phone with people as they take their strips out, the phones, the mobile phones, who describe very clearly that the strips are in the hives, they're in the cluster, but they still see varroa running around. All that's pretty good evidence that we actually do have a real resistance problem out there. Would it be nice if we'd done the bio, gone down the complete bioassay route, but the results, I think, at the moment, you would have to um, except that this is a real chemical resistance issue. So, where is it? Well, where we know it is, these are the places where we've had what we would class as credible water resistance. It looks like it's the top of the North Island. Um, I wouldn't read too much into that, actually. Um, and the reason why is because those are the places we've sampled bees from. We haven't really gone anywhere else. And we in England um, face the same sort of issue, and I'll show you some of their results in a few minutes. They spent, um, forget how many million pounds on, it was certainly over a million pounds, on working out the extent of resistance. I think our total spend at the moment is $150, but <laughs> we're kind of working our way up that way slowly. So our information's not quite as good as what the information that, they, that some other countries have. <coughs> So here's the English results, and you'll see um, some red dots. Um, those indicate apiaries that they found resistance in. The green dots, they rushed around and checked all those other hives, um, and the green dots is where they didn't, they actually checked the hives and they couldn't find resistance. So that was in 2002. They then went back, and I'm hugely impressed in this, and did it all over again the second year. You see how they spent a million, million dollars, sorry, a million pounds very quickly. You can see that there's that we're starting to get red dots um, outside of the initial area. Again, it's starting to spread into new areas. Um, spreading again, it's starting to infill some of these areas. It's not spreading hugely quickly. It's spreading geographically, but it's not infilling particularly quickly. <coughs> what does that tell us about what those resistance, the resistance is going to do in New Zealand? How quickly is it going to spread? The real problem is New Zealand's different from everywhere else in the world. We don't have a lot of maybe enough information to go on to even predict how fast it will spread. For two reasons. One is we move hives everywhere. Um, I'm guessing 60 to 70% of our hives at some stage end up on the back of a truck and it moves somewhere else. England's a mainly hobbyist industry where they really don't move hives around very much at all. Um, so there's a difference there. And perhaps the biggest difference is England is like most of the rest of the world and their approach to varroa control is you start off with one chemical until you've got resistance and then you introduce the second one. When you've got, into, when you've got resistance to that, you introduce the third one. Now we're not like that thanks to a number of chemical companies who want to register products and the Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries who sponsored the registration of a whole lot of other chemicals. 
you guys have had a whole range of different treatments that you use available. And most of you, I'd really love to say all of you, but it's be the case, have been, have been alternating treatments between spring and autumn. So it's a very different situation as far as the varroa is concerned because they've been treated with a whole lot of chemicals. Does this mean that varroa is going to spread faster? Going to infill faster or spread slower? We really don't know. <coughs> we can only watch with time and um, I guess when my phone rings and more beekeepers ring from elsewhere we'll get an idea of how quickly it's spread. So I guess the questions you want to ask for yourself is, um, do you have resistance? Um, this is not a real photo, by the way, so what happens when you drop a bee into a jar of varroa? Just in case anybody's wondering. So, how do you tell whether you've got resistance? At the moment, the NBA is carrying out a, the NBA is carrying out a resistance <coughs> survey. Um, they're asking beekeepers, or a lot of beekeepers have been asked, to collect a sample of bees from their hives as they take their treatments out. Now if you go and wash those in alcohol, you wouldn't expect, if you don't have resistance, you won't find any grower in there. Well, you might find one, I suppose. If you do have resistance, you'll find significant numbers of grower in there because they've survived the treatment. And it's a really easy test to do. Um, currently, um, we've only had a, about 120 samples through the lab out of the 1,000 or odd that we're expecting. And interestingly, they just bubble from the South Island. I'm not quite sure what that means. <laughs> Perhaps beekeepers in the North Island already know they've got resistance and are at least <coughs> to uh, have that um, fact publicised. But it's a really easy way to do. Sample after you've treated it and see whether you've got varroa. Or if you want to get fancy, like the beekeeper in the email, um, use the USDA test. Uh, very simple piece of equipment, very simple to do. Have a look at the varroa manual and explain the actual methods. And you can do that in any stage that you've got some grower in your hive, you can test whether there is resistance. <coughs> now here's the ways of not working out whether you've got grower resistance. Unfortunately, this is the most current and preferred method for beekeepers in the North Island at least, to work out whether they don't have, whether they've got resistance or not. Don't go and look for parasitic mite syndrome. That's the symptoms you get with high grower levels. Because if you find it, it's too late you've already damaged your hives and they may not survive even if you do put a treatment in. Don't look to around to see if you've got a lot of default wing virus. Same argument, it's too late. Um, you want to pick up resistance before it's causing damage. And um, 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, when we were down here explaining to everybody about Varroa to start off with, we were trying to make this argument, but um, it still hasn't sunk home. Unless you've got very, very, very high varroa levels, you can't determine varroa levels just by looking at bees. And this be the reason why, varroa hide themselves very well. Certainly if a colony's about to die, you'll probably be able to see varroa, but other than that, it's not a good measure of anything really. And the last one, which again is quite popular in the North Island at the moment, um, the way you know you've got resistance is because your colonies are dying on you. Say the guy, the person in the email that was um, his method at least. So you, we kind of need to be smart about this. You need to know you've got resistance early enough to be able to do something about it. The question we always get asked is, okay then, I've, if I've only got one hive, it's really easy question to answer. How many hives do I have to sample? <coughs> if you've got a thousand or two thousand, it's a much, much harder question. And if you go and look at the literature, um, what other people have found overseas, it's very quiet on the subject. Nobody actually in the literature provides an answer. So unfortunately, we don't have a clue at this point in time. The survey, if we get enough sample from, samples from resistant apiaries, might give us a hint, but we don't know. So perhaps the real answer is, how many hives are you prepared to lose? Um, if you're only gonna sample, if you've got a thousand hives, and you're only gonna sample one hive and one apiary, it's probably not going to give you a good picture at all. But how many you need to sample, we really can't give you good guidance at this point in time, unfortunately. So, future for synthetic chemicals here. They've been great, they really have. They've been like a magic bullet. You can put them in your hives and um, 
go away on holiday. Come back, take them out, um, and that don't have the sample, we don't have to do anything. Um, we, if you remember back 10 years ago, we did all these workshops around the country, two day workshops. In reality, and um, Paul Bolt is here, so I might not say this too loudly, um, we probably, because they paid for it all, we probably could have just sent you all, all an email actually, and just said put your treatments in this time and take them out at this time, and that's all you needed to know. And that's the way it was. But now, unfortunately, the world has changed. Um, certainly for beekeepers in the North Island, uh, up in North Island, and possibly for other places that we don't know yet. <coughs> so, what are we, where does, where does synthetics fit at the moment? You still have to alternate chemicals, even if you've got resistance. Probably especially if you've got resistance. You also need to treat early. Now this is the this is the thing. this is the one that's probably the most for obvious it's a fine, but for commercial beekeepers, this is the one of the two things they're going to really struggle with. And the reason why, and we've got a graph here of the number of varroa in a hive, and this is days, it's uh, and as you see, varroa levels increase exponentially. Now, if you were going to treat these hives early, if your treatment didn't work, varroa levels are still low, you can still do something about it. But if you're going to treat late and your treatment doesn't work, that's it. They, by the time you, even if you come and sample at the end, by the time you sample, it's, varroa levels are way too high ever to be able to save those colonies. So the first message here is treat early. I've had phone calls with beekeepers who uh, have rung up and said, look, I've taken my strips out and I've got varroa everywhere. And uh, what should I do? And it's in June at this point in time. <laughs> and the answer is um, next year. Treat early so that if it doesn't work, you've got time to do something about it. Something you must really, really consider very carefully here, that magic bullets didn't matter if you treated late. If you can't guarantee it's going to work, you have to treat early. And the second one, and again for a hobbyist it's easier, especially if you've only got one hive, but if you've got 5,000 it's really difficult and it means a real change in some business practices, is you have to check that it's worked. It's no longer a magic bullet. You've got to make sure that your treatment has worked. And remember, that's not by seeing how many colonies have died. Um, we'll see how much damage is done to the colonies. You need to find some of the method of doing that. The methods out there, one of my favorites, um, which it says in the manual, is this sugar shake method. You just cut sample of bees, put some sugar in it, tip them upside down, turn it around a couple of times, tip them outside, and you can shake the water out. Point to remember that if this is the scent you're removing from bees, this is the number of shakes you're doing. One shake gets you about 80%. Two more shakes get around 95%. You've got to actually know a little bit about the test other than just putting the sugar in to be able to interpret results. Or the other one that we're using in the lab at the moment, as I mentioned on the resistance survey, you just uh, take your sample of bees after your treatment, you wash them in alcohol and see and see if you've right. But even washing in alcohol takes a takes a little bit of knowledge. This is the time you have to shake it for and percentage of row removed. It's in the manual again, if you want to have a look at it. You actually either can shake for a long time to get close to the varroa off, or you can just rinse it three times and get really high emissions as well. So there are a number of methods you can use. Just check to make sure you're using them properly. So, synthetics. And I'm gonna say this four or five times, um, hopefully to get the message across. Alternate chemicals. Treat early, check that it's worked, and of course the other one is retreat if necessary. The alternative is, and I guess some beekeepers are going to take this approach, is they will lose colonies and try to replace them every year as a management system for Aurora. And you see that overseas, and in the States they lose around about 30% of their colonies every year, um, mainly because of resistance. Okay, we can't finish our discussion on, on synthetics without talking about this other product that's out there in the world. There are a number of other 
to their treatments out there. Most of them are absolutely not acceptable to New Zealand, um, like phobics we fumigate colonies because the residues are really just too disastrous. And no Western-based agricultural um, beekeeping countries use them. But there is one out there at the moment, other one at the moment, which is um, cheap mite, which is Kumafos. It's not a nice chemical, but it's used around the world. It's used in North America. Um, it's used all the way through Europe uh, for varroa control. Bayer made an application to the EPA to register in New Zealand, I think, two years ago. Four years ago? Yeah, oh, well, I think it was five, but it was somewhere around that. Um, and the EPA looked at it, and there was a lot of resistance from the beekeeping industry at that point in time. Um, mainly around because of the residues it might leave if it wasn't used correctly. The EPA looked at it and said, oh yeah, no, beekeepers don't like it, so we'll not register it. And they said to Bayer, we'll reconsider it once chemical resistance is found in New Zealand. And I guess the question we've got to ask ourselves, or you guys have to ask yourselves, is are we far enough down that track now to be considering putting another chemical, be it one that there are issues with, in our varroa control arsenal? There's two, there's two issues here, I guess. One is it does, it's a varroa control chemical used in big chunks of the world, so it has that preference for it. The other issue you have to ask is having an extra chemical in our, in our arsenal at the moment is it going to extend the life of all the other chemicals we've got? If you can alternate, instead of between two <coughs> chemical classes, you can alternate between three chemical classes. What it might do, it might increase the life of a, the other chemicals that we're already using. So I think it's probably timely now to go back and consider that at least. The same decision might be made at that point. Or with careful examination, we might decide that there's actually merit now in um, having the uh, third chemical class available for a control in New Zealand. And if that's the case, there's a process. Um, we have to, you'd have to introduce, sorry, convince Bayer that um, that they want to go and spend the money on taking it all the way through the process. And it won't happen overnight. They've got to go back through the EPA, and get their approval, and then it's got to go to ACVM to get through the registration process. So even if a decision was made tomorrow, it might be a year or so before it um, ever appeared on New Zealand shelves. But certainly something that I think, now that we have resistance, we really need to be giving some serious consideration to. So, life after synthetics. <coughs> Can you control for oil without using synthetic chemicals? The thing to bear in mind is that 90, probably 98% of varroa control in New Zealand is synthetic chemicals. Around the world, probably 95% of varroa control is with synthetic chemicals as well. So there's not a lot of people and a lot of places that have gone down this route. And the issue here is there is a whole lot of other ways of controlling varroa other than just putting synthetic chemicals in. And you remember, those of you who are around when Varroa first came in, we did these workshops. Most of the two days was talking about everything you could do other than putting synthetic chemicals in and explaining how to do them. And I'm just going to go through them briefly, um, just to remind those of you who went around there of what other tools there are out there. There are a number of proprietary products, um, and currently they're all around thymol use that are out there. Um, there's a number of, there's, you can also, if you want to do it cheaper, you can use generic thymol, and this is work that the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries um, funded. The one, they funded us to get the, these uh, generic products registered, but also to look at some of the, F, we get some efficacy data around them. There's a whole lot of formic acid treatments that are approved out there that can be used for row control, and I understand from, uh, you, might, you might have saw that there's a company that's looking at bringing on a uh, proprietary product, by a trade name product, onto the New Zealand market sometime soon as well. Again, based around formic uh, acid. Oxalic acid, which is a really great product, it's actually cheaper than sugar syrup, interestingly, um, but it only kills phoretic mites, and only kills the mites and the bees. 
And I guess the issue with all of these products, and the reason why nobody, hardly anybody uses them out there, is their kill rate, they're not magic bullets. You, know, you can't just put these treatments in your hive and go on holiday. Mostly you've got to come back in the middle of your treatment and, and exchange them so it's an extra trip. But you've also got to check to make sure they worked because sometimes they don't. And I'll just show you an example here of our treatments. And these are just the um, generic ones, the ones that don't have a label that says you can use this for aurora control, but you can go and buy it in your chemical manufacturers. And these should have noticed that this is percentage kill rate. <coughs> some of them are average around 90%, and some as low as this one here, which is oxalic acid, because it only kills the whites of the bees, around 40 to 50%. You have to be careful about averages though. And the reason why, and we'll go and look at just one of these, uh, say five or one of them. We'll go and look at an actual apiary. And here we have 2019 hives, percentage kill. The average is quite good, but the variation is not so good. We want 95% control. For all of these hives, it's great. It's good as AB stat, absolutely. These other hives down here, if you were treated and just left them, they wouldn't have survived. And that's the problem with a lot of these organic chemicals, is this huge variation. And the variation, what, another way of looking at it is, say 95% control, probably uh, something about 80%. 80, 80 the amount of control affects hugely how long your treatment will be effective for eventually. I mean, how long will you be, your varroa levels be kept at a really low level. Here we have varroa, and this is the number of days here. If you've got a 99% kill rate, you won't have to treat again for a long time. But a small difference, like a 90%, it's only a 10% difference, it's really not going to slow down varroa very much. And if you've got an 80%, you take out your treatment, you might have to be back there in a, in a month's time to go and retreat it because you have to get varroa down. So they're not magic bullets. They take more time, and they take a lot more knowledge um, on how to get really the best out of them. The idea is, in the end, to put together an integrated control program, which I'll talk about. I'll just have a couple of other, other treatments. Um, which is really a way of putting all these treatments together so that you can use them to get effective control out of them. But the answer for organics is the same for synthetics now. You need to alternate chemicals because varroa can build resistance to anything. You need to treat early, you need to check that it's worked, and you need to retreat if needed. You probably, hopefully you'll remember this now because I've said it about five times now. The other thing I suggest you do is have a go with them. And um, this kind of makes it, it makes it a little scary for me at this point in time. Um, especially since there's so, male, so many males in the room. Um, beekeepers, beekeepers do experiments with a thousand hives, which um, if, if you can do an experiment with five hives, you can do with a thousand, you always pick a thousand. I'm not sure what that's all about. But what I'm suggesting is pick a few hives, five or 10, have a go at trying, trying, trying to control grow with organic chemicals. Get an idea of the difficulties involved. Um, better that than at some later stage when you're dealing with resistance, you suddenly make the rash decision to go and experiment with a thousand lives. And um, organic chemicals may kill more grow the may kill more beehives, I should say, than resistance does. A couple of other things that are out there. Food grade mineral oil fogging. It's lots of fun. Um, it can explode. <laughs> Just a little matter of warning. Does it work? Um, um, Frank Lindsay on the camera back there would, would put his thumb up at this point in time. I've not seen any real data to convince me yet, even though it is registered. Drone trapping works on the principle that bees are attracted to drone brood. Um, so you put a drone comb in there, once it's capped, you take it out, you can take a lot of varroa out. According to Dutch, you can control varroa completely by that method. You actually don't need to do anything else, as long as you do, do three world time treatments. Mesh floorboards, which a lot of beekeepers have made this decision on already, 
as a method of trying to reduce varroa levels because any varroa that falls off your hive will fall through the mesh for them. And the one which is the subject of most of the rest of today, um, which fits into that package of, of things that you can put together to control the varroa, is tolerant queens, which I won't say any more about because all the other speakers will be talking about that at great length. So I guess the summary with the organic chemicals is there are a lot of there are a lot of tools out there. The real problem is at the moment is there isn't a good package. That we can't tell you use this chemical then, use this chemical then, <coughs> do drone trapping then, and then your varroa is sold for you. We're putting a proposal into MSI, hopefully this coming season, with the intent to try and answer some of those questions. We've, we've, done, we've done the work to work out how each how efficient every chemical is by themselves. The next step in that program, of course, was to how do you put them together now in an integrated program to successfully control for all. So we keep our fingers crossed that MSI likes that idea and um, will find us to do it. The other part of the program was we were going to put the results as an extension method directly on the internet so you could learn by our mistakes rather than having to uh, make themselves almost live on the internet, which is going to be an interesting prospect. So, the future, I guess, to kind of tie this all up. What are our options out here? There's the do nothing approach, um, which is the default approach, I guess, which is we decide if we can't work out what to do is what we'll take. What the results of that is going to be is we're going to lose increasingly numbers of hives, and that's what we see worldwide. The scary thing is, is that it's going to encourage beekeepers to find their own solutions. And when I mean, say, own solutions, I mean using unregistered chemicals. They might go down to their local uh, fruit feed suppliers and have a look around on the shelves and see, well, my burrow control's aren't working, I'll find, one that I'll find something else I can go and play with. That's the scary thing, that's the most scary thing, I think, with the do-nothing approach. And the, we've talked about resistance and we've talked about Bavrol and Abistan, Abistan, which are the ones that are implicated at the moment, which leaves us one other synthetic, which is Abivar. If you're relying on just one, what may happen is we may all just rely on one synthetic chemical, and its lifespan will be decreased because of that. Short-term solution. I don't know how short term we're talking about. We may be talking about a few years. Um, we in America introduced Kunafos. They had resistance within a year, but um, they had been using Kunafos agricultural chemicals illegally in beehives for a number of years before that, which probably contributed towards it. So short term might be as little as a couple of years. Long term might be 10 years, we just don't know. Uh, it's never been used in a situation like ours where we've got a variety of other chemicals. It's kind of unknown territory. Great place to be, but it's, it is unknown. And I guess the kind of long-term solution, other than some scientists somewhere in the world coming up with some other new magic bullet that's going to make Varroa go away for you, but they haven't done so in uh, 20 years, so I'm going to hold your breath on it is to go around the IP, down the integrated control approach, which is what almost every other industry, or most other horticultural and agricultural industries are doing now to control whatever pests and diseases they've got. It has problems with it. The problems is that it's more expensive to do, um, without a doubt. The advantage with it is it's sustainable. Um, so to better go to integrated control with a few people who've tried it in New Zealand, you have to rearrange your whole business to accommodate it, unfortunately. But, as I say, for the future, it's, it's needs to be considered. So in conclusion, yeah, sorry for getting this one again. If I say it enough times, people, people might get the message, I guess. Alternate <laughs> chemicals. If you're not doing it already, you need to be doing it. You need to be treating early. Uh, what's early? I don't know for down here. Um, where we keep bees in the Waikato, I would guess the end of January is the time to be treating. Um, if you've got you've got a problem, if you've got a honey flow that's going to last for a few months after afterwards, but that's usually not the problem in the Waikato. Um, 
But even then, you may have to sacrifice honey crop to get that, those treatments early. You need to find some strategy for checking to make sure your treatments have worked. Or you can take uh, the email approach, which is wait till you see your colony's dying and then you'll know it doesn't work. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't give you a solution, unfortunately. And then retreat um, if needed. So I guess that's the message. Synthetics are still here. We can't guarantee they're working at the moment <coughs> everywhere. You need to treat them with caution. You need to do these sorts of things if you're using synthetics. If you're using organics, you need to do them as well. We need to consider whether we want to add another chemical to our arsenal, bearing in mind there are problems with it as far as residues, but there are problems that everybody else in the world has accepted. And we need to be looking at integrated control. And as I say, the queen side of it, integrated control, is what the other speakers we talking about. And I'll stop there and take questions. <coughs> So the question was that even though I don't know, do I want to guess? I think that's what you were saying. Well, yeah, sort of. Like, there must be a statistical angle we can take to get a yeah. fair picture. Exactly. Fair. So if you've got that, it's a statistical angle that we can use to design a sample program for resistance. I, we could only do that if we had any some idea of what the distribution was out there. The only sample we've got from a whole apiary, one apiary, <laughs> that I'm to base this on, is out of the resistance survey, there was one hive in that apiary that had a high row level after treatment. All the rest were fine. If you want to base it all on that, the answer is everything, unfortunately. Yes. Um, I'm a bit worried about the residues in the wax. Like when we did our varroa workshops, we um, learned that apistan and bavarol were in the same chemical family, and that apistan was 180 times more potent than bavarol. And um, and we also know that some beekeepers aren't taking their strips out, but maybe that's not the problem. Maybe the problem is that we're getting the residues from the apistan in the wax. So even if we take the strips out in time, we've got a sub-lethal dose which we're getting the resistance from. And I was just wondering why we're talking about check might where we're getting um, residues as well, and whether we should actually be using air treatments which leave any residues at all. You all follow that question? That could, um, is the, whether, you, whether our resistance problem <coughs> is related not to the actual chemical, but the residues that are left in the wax. There's been a lot of discussion in the scientific, scientific literature on that very point. Uh, I guess my point of view is that if the concentrations in the wax aren't high enough to actually kill varroa from the residues, then it's probably not putting any selection pressure on the varroa that's in there. But we do see people leaving strips in all year round, unfortunately. I hear, and I refuse to believe it, of people <coughs> reusing strips. Um, although that might, residues might be, in, I mean, might vaguely be an issue, I think there are other bigger reasons to suspect on the mechanism of resistance. <coughs> but it's a good point though. Uh, any data on the effect of the synthetic and the synthetic and the There is, this, the question was mesh bottom boards and how effective they are. There's been several studies uh, done overseas. Um, the reason there's several studies because the first ones couldn't find any effect. Um, eventually they did find an effect, find an effect uh, only a very small one. So mesh bottom boards are, if anything, they're an addition to everything else you do. They're certainly not a substitute for anything. <coughs> yes. Um, could you give us a summary on the how England and America has approached this problem, seeing that they were back at this point for a few decades ago. America is an interesting case because it's a commercial industry. Um, their approach to varroa control is you introduce one chemical, and when you have resistance, you introduce the next one and the next one, which is the greatest way to lose all your chemicals really, really fast. 
The middle ground is what we do, which is alternate. The best ground is if we used all chemicals at the same time, which um, we, we, we thought would be really smart and come up with a product like that, so we checked for patents. And a certain chemical company has a patent on that idea. We asked them if they wanted to do it, they said no, and then what us to do it either, interestingly. Um, so what they've got is they've gone through all their chemicals, they've got resistance to everything that you can imagine there. I was watching a seminar where what the beekeeper was doing was fumigating with armatraz. So he was taking his bees, he was shaking them all into another box, and and with onto other foundation, fumigating them there because the residues were so bad from the huge concentrations he was using, and then coming back and shaking them all back into his other hive wear again to try and reduce the amount of residues he's transferring back in again. Um, there's all sorts of, everybody's doing something different, and the, the, any way you look at it, it makes New Zealand look really, really, really good at this point in time. So they don't have any solutions. Um, and that, sorry, and they have 30, 30 without colony collapse disorder, they have 30% high risk. They don't have an answer. In the UK? Less clear about what's ha happening there. It's really a hobby industry. Um, so there's a whole lot of individual people doing their own thing, what happened there. They've just started introducing organics. But if you've only got a couple of hives, you can, it's quite easy to, it's, you're much in a better position to afford being able to come and do a number of treatments and to cheap treatments. So it may not be a good model. You might be research on methorisiums that died. No, we're still doing it. Um, going <coughs> back, we seem to be going backwards rather than forwards at the moment. Um, the idea, the metarisium was the fungus that um, we've been using to try and, as a varroa control treatment as part of an integrating program. We've, uh, the company who uh, we're trying to commercialise it have changed the, the organism two times now and the formulation once. <coughs> Um, and um, yeah, we just can't. With the changes, we can't get it. We can't get the results that we were getting there originally. So where that's going to go at the moment, we're just not too sure. Um, I got the impression um, when you were talking about the resistance to copper and all viral, that the guys that are copper resistant were all altered the making between overall and Abistan. That was the impression of the top. Yeah. Am I wrong? There, there's this. They think, they think we know Drapi Bar, they've gone between the same family. More than that, mo there's a lot of them, and I, <coughs> as a North Island, I'm not sure I'm not really coming to any of this, who are just using Apistan. <coughs> they're not even doing anything. They, they're just Apistan <coughs> in the spring, Apistan in the water. Yeah. So, so, so if, you, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna alternate chemicals, different chemical classes, yeah. We can't hear. Question down here. Mark, um, you know, the cock was made before it got loaded of that the ingredient of Ampistan strip. Only 10% of that is released over an eight-week treatment period. So the loading may be high, but that actually not being totally released into the bees or the wax. So the question the question was of the the very high loading of fuvalinate in Ampistan strips. How much of it's actually been released? Um, we know more of it's been released than with the other product, Bavarol. You, you very Bavarol is food, is food methyl. You very seldom see food methyl residues in wax, but we worldwide we quite often see uh, food methyl residues in wax. That's correct. Yeah, but there is residues here. Yeah. Another question over here. Well, with the integrated pest management, what do you use on the confectioner's sugar to increase grooming? And maybe using it with the um, sticky pour to get the mites when they fall increases yeah. grooming as well behavior. So the question is, like our sugar shake, what happens if you um, spread sugar, icing sugar, through your hive? It causes bees to groom. It takes grow off your off your hives. Sorry, off your bees, and they'll fall through. If you've got a ventilated floorboard, it would be even better, I think. Um, it's another method that can be used part of an integrated control program. By itself, it's not a it's not a replacement for the synthetic chemicals we've got. But again, it's another tool. Not one we've tested in New Zealand, unfortunately. Yes. This question about oxalic. I've heard 
Well, what I've read is you should only use it in the brewer's period uh, during winter where you can make kill the ones that are on the bees. But I've also heard that in places like Wales they use it a lot more often than that and very often when they go to their hives they will, they will use it even during, at, at any time of the year. Do you know if that's able to be done or what? So the question was with oxalic acid. Um, which, as I say, I kind of like because it's cheaper than sugar. Um, it works, that the recommendation is for a Brutus period, and can you use it more often than that? For a Brutus period is the most effective time to use it. It will still work um, at other times. There's one study, just one, which makes which make you nervous, that if you do repeated treatments, your colonies will not build up again as well the next spring. That really needs to be repeated because if you could use oxalic acid every time you were in there, it only takes a second, it could be a much more powerful tool than it is. Um, so the, the answer is, yes, you can. There's a little suggestion that it may affect what the colonies do the next season, but it really needs to be repeated here to get a really good idea of that. Right. No, got <coughs> just a little bit. In addition to the oxalic acid, when I was in Europe, some beekeepers there were using 7.5% oxalic for their winter treatment and their theory or belief was that it would kill all the virus infected bees so the only bees left were the healthy ones. <laughs> All <laughs> the, the colonies weren't particularly strong either. Did you trial the uh, 4.9 millimetre cell size and how effective was it? Um, yes we did and Michelle um, who we're talking about Queensland later, actually did the trial for us. So it was, I think, probably the first or second trial she ever did with, uh, with us when she started. Um, we could find no effect at all. There's been three or four international studies now also that were unable to find any um, effect. Um, the conclusion from the scientific community is that we can't find any effect from small cell size. However, American beekeepers and from us, some of, some of the, um, I was going to say love emails, hate emails that Michelle got when she published the study um, are, of a di are, of, are of a different, posi different position to what the scientific community is on that subject. Because I spent a month with Dee Luxby in Arizona and no problem at all there. Yeah, they had all sorts of claims out there, but every time anybody tests it independently, they can't, they can't find um, any effect. We have had it slide up comparing the, um, the success of the various chemicals. Oxalic came in very low. Do you know if that was taken during the brooders period? Or? Yeah, it, was, it was during brood. I could have showed you another graph that shows you the effectiveness is directly related to the amount of brood there is in the colony. You can create brooders periods during your requeening if you want to. There's all sorts of ways you can improve that. Or as um, was suggested here, if we had the data to show that there's no negative effects, then perhaps just repeated treatments, um, getting it off the fruit bites might be the way around. That's it's a great tool if, you, if we, we're going to use it properly. And another question too, you said that when, um, for example, the, the, the kill rate for a for example, would be 95 to 100 percent. Do you know what the 5 percent would be like? The, the way that it's measured is that you treat for eight weeks, with one chemical and then you put another chemical in for another six or eight weeks and work out how many extra varroa die. But of course other varroa are coming into the hive all the time and you may just, it kind of dampens that, that relative effectiveness. It's more about the methods testing rather than how you treat. The question's always there, can you get rid of actually all the mites as long as you don't have resistance in a hive with maybe stand and probably getting really close to it actually. was if, if through good alternation between, I think you were saying Bavrol and Apivar, whether you can stave off resistance. You can certainly slow it down, 
one question you've got to ask yourselves is whether you want to import it or not. I somebody could just bring back down a whole lot of resistant bees yesterday. Um, it's already been happening, I think, too. So I which may have yeah. Um, but as a as a policy, it's still the best approach um, to continue with that. And we we don't have ten years um, in the North Island. That's assuming it's this resistance is home growing. The first question when we saw it, um, when I was talking to Matt about it, was we may just had another incursion of bees and resistant varroa. Um, there's all sorts of explanations for why it might be there. So how long will stave it off, I don't know, but it's just really best practice without a doubt. Just uh, going back to the oxalic acid uh, format, has there been any uh, work on the efficacy of either the vapour or the solution form? The, the work, the, the results I showed you very, very briefly, we could have spent half an hour on the subject, yeah. Yeah. was liquid. Liquid, yeah. It was liquid. If you were in uh, Canada, um, they fumigate yeah. um, with, uh, with an evaporator of, with oxalic acid, which yeah. apparently works very well as well. Yeah. I use that down here in, as part of a winter treatment. Yeah. Yeah. That's, of course, not registered and it's probably illegal. But, <laughs> but we don't know who you are, so that's okay. And, uh, we'll skip over that one. Can, can you comment on the variation in that graph where you tested a whole lot of hives of, with non-chemical and you got such a variation from 95% pill? Can, uh, can you comment on that more? So the question was, if you're using the example I showed you with thymol, that you get a big variation in curl rate for, between hives? Some hives are works in very well and not others. And the question is why? We don't know. We've got a project which um, food in their um, in their moment of kindness are actually paying for to try and answer some of those questions. Um, somebody just asked us yesterday whether if we had done the, used the same hives um, two months later and tried again, would the ones where it worked really well and work well and again? <laughs> Was it something to do with the hives? Was it something to do with the bees themselves or the varroa or the amount of ventilation in the hive? We just don't know, unfortunately. And if we knew, we could perhaps solve it. So you're going down that track to try and find that out? Yeah, that's where we're starting at, at the moment is for as long as the funding's only for a year, so we'll see how far we get with it. Thoughts? Yeah, um, one of the things that I'm concerned about, and you're hearing it from the North Island, you're starting to get the South Island, is the under treatment with strips. And that's just, I think people have got to be very careful about that, just walking for a disaster. So, so the question was whether what's happening with this under treatment using fewer strips than you should do, um, which he's heard from the North Island, people are doing at least. <laughs> the, the main issue in, New Zealand, in the North Island, and I guess down here as well as two, one of them is there's some people who don't alternate, and the other one very quickly pointed out, most people, I think we're talking about most people under treat. They worked out that one strip of AP stand is, is as good as two, or two strips of barrel is as good as four. Now, absolutely now, and I perhaps should have put it on my list, <laughs> don't, don't under treat. <coughs> if you're under treating, then resistant mites have even better chance of surviving. <coughs> thank you for that, that was a really good point. Just one more one. Uh, uh, I'll talk to you later on, but um, one of the things that people use in different organic treatments is they're actually going to set their hives up in the correct way to get them to work properly. That's something that some people may not be aware of as well. Yeah, perhaps we can discuss it later. Yeah. Yeah. Has there been any work done on um, the heritability of resistance within the white population to chemical treatment? Um, I'm thinking it's taken 10 years for the population to develop the resistance. So the great question was that if you withdraw the chemical, how could people with resistance decline? That's um, another question. Um, within a couple, there's been a number of studies done around the world, and within a couple of years, they found that they've once they swapped out the chemicals, that that resistance does start to disappear quite quickly. And the reason why is mites that are resistant to chemicals aren't good at doing other things. 
the chemicals not there. They have a big advantage by the chemicals there when they don't, and then they crossbreed with all the non-resistant ones. But the problem is, and we and this piece of data we have much less about, when you bring it back in, how quickly does it develop again? And the suggestions out there are very quickly. Might work really good the first year, but the next year it may be slightly slower. What are the chances of getting resistance to two, the, the two main treatment families at the same time if you put the strip, two different strips at the same time? So the question was, if you put two different strips in the same hive, what's the chance of getting resistance to both of them at the same time? The, the, the general theory around this for pest control is that if you've got to get resistance to one chemical, if that's a 100% uh, chance, the chance that you'll get resistance to two at the same time is probably about 0.01%. The chance of getting three resistant three chemicals at the same time is so small that you... And, that, and that's why you've got, if you have any sheep farmers here, you have these trenches that are multi-chemicals. It's, it's all based around that. Yeah, so why aren't we doing that? The first problem is you have to have enough treatments in there to make sure that each one of those chemicals is in high enough concentration. So you, you couldn't put one AP VAR strip in and one AP, AP stand strip in. You'd have to give a full treatment of AP stand and a full treatment of AP VAR um, to do it. And it's twice the cost, and I guess the residues are twice as much. But it's as a strategy for mite control, it's actually quite a good one. I just wanted to make a comment about the mash bills with the sugar, and which I've done, and it does make the bees brutal, but you have to be really sure that you, your mesh floor is sealed up from the outside, because otherwise the bees go underneath, and presumably the growers climb back on and go back in the hive, and, and certainly the ones I've got had that fourth defect, so I've had to put extra mesh around the outside to make sure it's bee proof underneath. Did you all get that? They were just saying that if you're using isotubule, which is not something we've ever done, to get the mites off the bees so they fall through your ventilated floorboard, you have to enclose it because otherwise the bees just crawl around underneath the floorboard to get the icing sugar again and pick up all the mites and carry them back. That's a really good point. Yes, Barry. It's, it's, a, it's part of the survey, the National Beekeeping Association has contacted beekeepers North and South Island to send in samples of bees that were taken just after the treatments have come out. We've tested a lot of this, we're most of them are from the South Island, we haven't detected any resistance yet. But I'm also cognizant that people who think they've got resistance might be less likely to agree to provide samples. So you have to be a little bit cautious on these, those sorts of results. Oh, so I guess, or, no, 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 it's dry ice and dry ice and sugar rather than a solution. Um, probably use it any time, although I'm not, oh sorry, do you want to answer down the back? Um, I do it every time I open my hive up. I just put a quick dusting over with them. Um, with, um, the quick? A sieve, and then I brush it over with my bee brush, yep. and I've got a sticky board underneath the, 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 um, the mesh, and you get a really quick drop rate. But I do it every time I open the hive. The question was in the winter? Probably don't open your hive. Um, well, I did it when I did my winter check. I just do it whenever I open the hive. It takes seconds. Yep. 